Thank you, Ken, for joining us uh, for this week's podcast on uh, another calm day in the tranquil world of uh, Westminster. <laughs> We've just heard that the meaningful vote, or something like it, some test of popularity of the withdrawal agreement is, is coming to, tomorrow. But I'd like to ask you, first of all, about uh, what happened last night and the indicative votes and where you think that process is going. Your particular amendment, which was pushing the customs union, possibly a bit more, it left it open, but it stated the customs union, that did quite well out of a bunch of horses that didn't really reach the finishing line, but it did, it, it did quite well. What do you think is its future? What do you think happens on Monday? Uh, I think we're going to have to have a second set of votes on Monday, perhaps a different method of voting, which I would advocate. I've been urging transferable votes in order to get people to concentrate on something that can command the widest possible consensus or majority. Uh, we, we, it was at, the people who arranged yesterday, which didn't include me, Oliver Letwin and his colleagues, anticipated that a lot of people yesterday would just plump for their first choice and vote against all the others to try to get their first choice through. So everything winds up with a minority. Now, I voted for several of the things yesterday. I, and I advocated to everybody, just vote for as many things as you could live with. Come out of your trenches, they were told, weren't they? Yeah, well, yes, and we've got to compromise. Mm. But not everybody did yesterday, but mine nearly made it. It was only lost by eight votes. I, I think mine got nearer. And that's because the one I tabled was a bare minimum. This was the very least I would, you know, thought was acceptable, which is to mandate the government to stay in the customs union, a permanent customs union, as part of the negotiations, which I think the other EU governments would all readily agree to. We nearly made it. I also voted for the common market. I mean, my first preference would be to stay in the European Union. And on Monday, we've got to have something which gets everybody to think, well, my first perfect choice, in my opinion, we may not get. So what in the national interest am I prepared to accept as a compromise? I shall try mine again. And as far as I know, the House of Commons is full of people planning and plotting all kinds of other motions, you know, composites, as the Labour Party would call them, uh, in order to try to get something that we'll get through on Monday. Yes, people are talking about maybe fusing a couple of the most popular ones. So maybe your ones well, could... Well, they're the ones who didn't very, do very well, who are wanting to fuse their ideas you don't want to fuse. into somebody else's that is better. You don't want to fuse. You're up for compromise, but not on your amendment. I, 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 I vote for the maximum close relationship with the EU if we insist, as this Parliament will, on leaving. Uh, but I wish to keep there the thing which is most likely to get a majority, which is the lowest common denominator, the thing that has most supporters, fewest enemies. Uh, I would like to see more than just a mandate on the customs union. I would like a mandate to stay in the single market as well, for example. We'll vote for it probably. You must you know, realise that you've got to get the numbers together to form a kind of cross-party coalition which is in the majority and can give the government authority in the negotiations. And just so people understand what, what was going on here, Theresa May's withdrawal agreement, uh, something you've voted for... I've always voted for, yes. Um, it's quite harmless. That, that doesn't tell you that much about the future relationship. And, Nothing at all. And, and so you're trying to paint in, lock in, our future relationship, as it were, as a guarantee. You're not going to just, no blank check for the withdrawal agreement, but you want to know where it's heading afterwards. That's what that, your yes, amendment because is I, about. I, I, I sat, through more, I sat through more of the debates of the House of Commons, probably, I bet there's no member sat through more of them, which is what I based my judgment of where a majority might lie on. But. And, and the, 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 my, my mind was really aimed at getting the Labour Party. And to my pleasure and surprise, the Labour Party whipped in favour of mine, which gave me a lot of Labour votes, because uh, the, their argument against the Prime Minister's deal, because they have nothing against the Prime Minister's deal, it, it, it is that it was a blind Brexit. They want to know what comes say next. where we were going. Mm. And it, they, they're not going to get a full negotiating mandate laid down now. But permanent customs union mattered to them, and permanent customs union, therefore, is at least that we can instruct the future government to 
be the basis of what it's aiming for and in the negotiations. That's the heart of my next question. Instruct the government. Now that that's the happened. next constitutional crisis. Well, that, that, that hasn't actually happened before. And it, you, we're looking at a prime minister well, it who's... all the time. Yeah, but not in, not in a massive strategic direction like this. A central matter okay, of no, the no, treaty. No, no government's ever pursued a policy on a massive strategic issue defying the opinion of the majority of the House of Commons. But the point is, can this government, with a Prime Minister who seems to have signed her own political death warrant, actually hold together to implement it? What's the delivery mechanism? Well, and can you be sure? They're going to have to reform themselves. What and, does I that mean? mean? There's, there, there, I think that we're losing a sight of a lot of the basic principles of a parliamentary democracy. And all kinds of things are being cited, often by ministers, about the role of Parliament and so on, which are absolute rubbish. They aren't ancient traditions. They've been invented in the last two years because they're in a mess. Governments can only pursue major policies which have the support and approval of a majority of the House of Commons. Governments of any complexion cannot pursue policies which have been opposed by a majority of the House of Commons. So once the government is given an instruction by the Parliament, a mandate on these negotiations, it's up to the government to decide whether or how uh, they're going to accept. So they're going to deliver let, that. Let's go some through whether were, some of them will resign. Uh, and that's they, what you mean by reforming. Yes. And uh, then if, if get remains, rid of the Brexiteers and have a few ref remainers. Well, that of course would be my preference. But they, I can't see what way, other how else way, it could work. Well. It's not working now. You, you, you have a, a cabinet which is hopelessly divided, which plainly doesn't agree on policy, who are now publicly airing their views uh, with conflicting policies. And, and, and uh, uh, yesterday, you know, in, in the, the, this indicative vote process, they weren't even whipped. They were all allowed to cabinet, I think, to abstain, and anybody else could vote how they liked. Um, what we need is a proper functioning government with a clear mandate and the support of government, of parliament, which would actually get the European Union's other member states to stop despairing and realise they can have serious negotiations with a government that will be able to deliver the result with a majority in parliament. You, you've seen a lot of uh, governments, you've seen a lot of the House of Commons, probably never a sadder moment than you're living through now. But yeah, true. But how does Theresa May sustain a government while throwing out all the Brexiteers or allowing them to walk out because they don't like adopting a customs union? How does that hold together? Uh, she will have to reach out to the Labour Party uh, and have reached some understanding with either the Labour Party as a whole or the substantial body of the Labour Party which is sympathetic to a soft Brexit to actually sustain her majority on the subject. And she'd have to form a government uh, of, of, of people who broadly support that, then deliver it. And if we manage to put together a majority for anything on Monday, the, all the various plotters, which don't actually include me devising these systems, uh, had better make sure it's a majority that's going to last. And is, then we'll see us through negotiations, which I think will take at least two or three years, because we haven't touched on lots of other subjects yet, and, and finally give future generations the confidence of a sensible, beneficial, permanent relationship if we insist on leaving. Nobody's forcing you to look into a crystal ball none of us have, but does, does, is what you're saying there that you could imagine Labour backbenchers maybe coming across and serving as ministers in a, some kind of government of national unity or could it be a more informal structure? Which do you think is the most well, likely? I, I think that would be the ideal, but I think that's highly unlikely. I mean, it would have happened in the past, happened in 1931 and so on, but um, not in this parliament. This is this makes student politics look serious to uh, this particular parliament. But the, the, I'm just setting down some, some, some basic principles, which I think these various factions, I hope, can be led by you know, Theresa or somebody into accepting. I mean, Theresa, unfortunately, is a little unwavering. I mean, you know, or well, fine, I'm fairly stubborn myself. She, 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 she's very stubborn and she just has stuck to impossible red lines at times, long after it's obvious that she can't deliver it. But she has moved quite a bit. Her checkers 
arrangement included staying in the single market for goods. Now, if only we'd stuck with that, we'd never have heard any problem about the Irish border. We'd never, half this would never have happened. So she, she has moved a long way on some things. And I mean, now she's thinking about how does she ensure her last months are not those of a purely lame duck prime minister. I mean, it just, the political, she's got to find what political skills she has, try to put something together that will not only get us through the first stages of Brexit, actually look credible for delivering something in the future. All her enemies, having got rid of her, are now running around running their leadership elections. But fortunately, the European Research Group, our little breakaway party who want to take over the whole party, are not very competent and they're obviously campaigning against each other. So you, you never know. She's, she's, she could still pave the way for something more sensible. But that kind of reaching across the floor that you're talking about, she's not the ideal no, she's leader a, for that. She's is a she? Conservative Party. She's a, and this is not this is very this describes a lot of my friends. She's a, a, a classic conservative lady from the home counties, and she's a part. You know, keeping the party together has been one of her foremost concerns. Uh, the rate at which she's lost ministers from the more moderate end of her party rather indicates she's not been that successful. But so far, she's kept Jacob Rees-Mogg inside the fold, <laughs> but uh, she's going to have to think a bit broader than that, I think. And in fact, stop kowtowing to the European Research Group. Personality changes when you're in your 60s are quite rare, aren't they? Uh, I probably, I, I think I probably have to confess that would be the true as well. But no, she has shown flexibility. I say, this deal she's going to try to get through again, I mean, we're a million miles away from the sort of thing she was saying 18 months ago. Those, those disastrous speeches she gave, for example, Lancaster House. When pressed, she still goes back to those red lines, but actually she's moved all over the place trying to compromise since. And unfortunately, she's now looks as though she's in her last weeks or months. You know, I mean, she will want to, to settle this, leave her stamp on it. I hope she can be persuaded uh, to put the proper majority in the House of Commons together. The other vote that some people think did surprisingly well without Labour backing was should we revoke when we're very close, if we're very close to no deal? You backed that. Yes. If, if, if we got very close to no deal, could you imagine Labour coming on board? Could you imagine that actually happening? I hope so, uh, because the, one of the biggest majorities was against no deal. I mean, it certainly crept up, but by a majority of hundreds, the House of Commons rejected new de no, no deal. F at last, a flash of common sense. I mean, a lot of the public support no deal, but only because they're fed up with all this bickering, you know, why do we need a deal and all of it? And I can understand somebody saying, oh, I've had enough of all this, just as leave and so on. I mean, all you have to do is count to 10 and realize that tearing up every legal, trading, regulatory relationship you have with pretty well every other partner in the world and going back to the 1960s and starting again with a blank sheet of paper would be a disaster. If you don't believe me, listen to the CBI, the TUC, and everybody else who knows anything about how a modern country is run. And there's a massive majority against that. And I, it's not my, I've advocated a revoke. I've always voted for a revoke every time it's come up. Now, people say, oh, that's because you want us to stay in the European Union. But I've always said, well, of course I do. But uh, we, we, as we're still at, we've wasted three years and we're back at square one. Why not stop it, revoke? Why not get our act together and reach some consensus on what exactly it is leave means and what we want to put in place? Then if you want, you can start again. You can invoke Article 50. And I still think that would be the sensible thing to do. And fear of a no-deal Brexit could conceivably lead to a majority of the House of Commons accepting that. Well, I was, it was just me and the Scottish Nationalist Party three weeks ago it's now six, five to six million on a petition and a hugely increased number of members of the House of Commons who are accepting the logic of that. How would it go down in the country, do you think? 
Oh, the, the usual row, there's a daft. I mean, the public debate from beginning to end in the great respect in the media and so on is just silly. It, it, because nobody, nobody, English voter anyway, follows the arguments of the Irish border and the Irish settlement. People have the most confused notion of what a customs union single market is. Uh, and we, we all have, uh, you know, simplistic stuff of traitors and betrayal, you know, carrying out the Dunkirk spirit and so on. But so they'll say the elite the, 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 the serious government, uh, you know, involves taking tough and difficult decisions. Governments don't spend every day just getting an opinion poll out and saying our policy must be this. I served in the Thatcher government. We, we, we never had a popular policy. We were never popular normally between elections. We got deeply unpopular. But we, answered to the, we, we acted on our judgment. We took necessary decisions, structural reform. And then we answered to our masters, the people, for the results of what we'd done when the general election came. And Margaret always was miles behind in the polls. And then people would look at it and say, well, I suppose, you know, somebody had to do it, and we got re-elected. Nowadays, they all hire public relations men and tear around after tomorrow's headlines and the opinion polls. And it's, it's my, my favourite phrase is, it's no way of running a whelk stall. And, 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 and government and parliament now have got to take a medium, long-term view and put in place what they believe to be in the national interest. But you also have to have a bit of a sense of what the reaction will be, taking your point that you have oh, to you lead. Have all the stuff we've had. And yeah. might it not be that cubed? Well, well, there's no election until 2022. Are you confident of that? No, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. And it, there might not be. There might be no other way because out. Because we're risking a general election, but the vast majority of members of parliament on both sides of the House don't want a general election, nor do the public want a general election very much. Well, the public never wanted a referendum. We seem to get an awful lot of things we're not particularly mad keen on at the moment. It could be that we end up in one, couldn't it? And, and that could bring and what up... what would that result? Well, you tell me, as my question... I have a clue who would win it. Uh, uh, what sort of shape each party would be in, I have no idea. Um, they, they Presumably, at the moment, both parties are deeply divided into different factions, so it rather depends which faction got stronger, which got weaker in the general election. Then a new parliament will come back and it would probably be in a strikingly similar position to the present one. Might, five might, years to go. might make this one look rather better. Might make this one look like a tea party, yes. What health do you think your party is in? Does it have a long life ahead of it? Does it deserve one? Both parties are in such a serious crisis that they're at risk of not surviving. Uh, that's because the nature of the political debate and structure in this country, as in most of the other Western democracies, is changing. I'm a supporter of the two-party system, two broad pre-packed coalitions covering a very wide range of views, but agreeing to work together on a body of, uh, uh, of policies which they will deliver collectively, and then the public throwing one of them out when it's made a mess and giving the others a go and so on. I like that system. But it hasn't worked for some time. And the social pressures, the pace of change, changing nature of society hasn't adjusted to it. Now, the Conservative Party could survive because the Conservative, if you don't mention the word Europe, the Conservative Party is quite cohesive still. It's a big if, it, isn't is it? A, it is a broad based centre right party. Big if, yes. But it's always Europe that's it always causes the trouble in British politics. Uh, the Labour Party has a deep ideological divide. Uh, both have the problem of having silly constitutions which allow unrepresentative groups to seize control of associations and so on at grassroots level. But nevertheless, that certainly my party, let's talk about the Conservative Party, it's always been held together by a certain amount of tribal loyalty and a desire to be in power. If you're a conservative, centre-right one, you don't only want to further your political views, but you want to have the chance of putting them into practice. So conceivably, uh, when the Conservative Party wakes up from this nightmare, it'll have a bit of a hangover, 
but it might survive. But I mean, we, we, we've got dangerous in here just breaking it all up at various times already, and we've got to start calming down from now on. You mentioned the associations. Do they look to you like uh, they're pretty overly populated, from your perspective, by hardline Brexiteers? It's always been the case, actually. The, the, the associations have always represented the, the, the more you know, traditional right wing uh, members of the party, but they have the sense to produce a parliamentary party of a broad um, spectrum. And they, you didn't, they, John... didn't, they didn't used to have the power they've been given now to elect the leader and all that. When you were working with John Major in John Major's government, he could appeal over the heads of the Bill Cashes, it was still him, but <laughs> some of the, mm. some of the faith, John Redwoods, uh, to the membership and could try and pull them into line isolate them. Theresa May hasn't had that option. They're with the ERG hardliners, aren't they? A lot of them are. A lot of them are. Um, and uh, she hasn't been able to do it. That is true. Uh, and somehow her style hasn't lent itself to enabling her to do it. Whether uh, somebody else could do that, more political skills... But it tells you where the party's know. going, doesn't it? I mean, you're going to have a leadership contest before yes, too long. but the party, you know, is... You've got to, it can be steered out of these things. I mean, I, I, There's I, a lot of I, I don't go in for reminiscing as an old goffer, makes you sound an old goffer even more than you are. Uh, but, 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 you know, the, the party used to be mad keen on hanging. Um, and the, the leadership of the party never was in favour of hanging. And it was all manageable, you know, it's all right. Uh, and the, the, quite a bit of skill, political skill to keep the party together and just remind the party of their instincts to bond together, stay in office, keep the socialists out and all that. And do you think at the moment certain cabinet ministers with ambitions, maybe Jeremy Hunt, maybe Sanjay Javid, are doing the equivalent of saying, oh, don't worry, I'm pro-hanging, uh, but in Brexit politics terms, and are trying to appeal to those activists rather than maybe speak from their own consciences? Yes. Uh, but that's nothing new in politics. I mean, as you say, it sounds a bit like trimming. Uh, to be fair to them, if I, if I, I'm not campaigning for any of them, uh, but, but they would say they're trying to broaden their appeal. Uh, they're preparing themselves. Do you think they'll tackle the problem of keeping the party together and organising the party sensibly again? Uh, and uh, I think they're going to have to find some method of dealing with entryism as aren't well. They, aren't they doing what you used to accuse certain party leaders of doing, which is just feeding the crocodile? And actually, that way doesn't work. You can't just tack that way well, and tack they've got to be, they've got to be careful not to drop into that. Yes, you quite rightly say. I, and if you, if you just stand feeding the crocodile with buns, the worrying moment comes when you run out of buns. Uh, and feeding the crocodile has, I think, been the tendency of recent Conservative leaders. And that's why we can't win elections anymore with a proper majority. I mean, we haven't really won an election since 1992, when John Major achieved quite a personal triumph in winning it. John had more political skills than any of his successors have had. To those activists who are thinking maybe Boris Johnson's the answer to all this, Maybe Dom Raab. What's your well, advice? Well, like I say the ERG have formed a party within a party with their own leader, their own whip, who isn't at this stage personally a candidate for the leadership. They've got several candidates, and, and they kind of assume they're going to win. Uh, I'm not sure that will happen, but the Conservative Party hasn't lost all its uh, uh, old skills. And uh, what, what, quite apart from anything else, is what you know uh, as. My friend Michael Heseltine discovered, he who wields the sword never wears the crown. And here's, you know, she's going down at the moment with the stab wounds of the ERG all over her. It may be none uh, of them. And it may be our membership still have the old instincts. That they're not going to vote for any of them. If Boris Johnson did come in, do you think he'd, he could actually end up in a part of the political landscape no one would expect? I quite likely to. I, mean, I don't think he has any. I don't think Boris is very interested in policies or the detail of policy. And I don't think he, he's not been totally consistent, shall I say, in his political career. He, he's great at the photo opportunities. Outside Westminster, the wider uh, your generation outside Westminster, where, where, why did they spawn a revolution? I mean, 
Trump, Brexit, yellow jackets, weird anarchists taking power in Italy, all these other groups that get large blocks in Parliament to stop the mainstream politicians forming stable governments, happen in everyone. What are they angry about? They tend to be the older people, often. Uh, they're the people who think the pace, but the pace of change has been so rapid uh, that uh, in some cases it's left them behind. They're rather angry and confused by it. They're disappointed. The, the biggest problem uh, in most Western democracies, certainly in the United States, here uh, France, say, is the people who used to be the blue collar working class who had good, steady jobs in factories, mines, foundries, which they were proud of, jobs for life, and a structured, rather splendid society, which, you know, I come from originally, um, which backed the labor movement, backed the social democrats, backed the democrats in America, uh, and it gave us stability. The 2008 crash, the pace of change, automation, hit that group very hard. Uh, I mean, if you're bright and young and in London, you're doing terribly well out of the digital economy or in financial services. There ain't much good in Barnsley or Hartlepool. And the older, rather angry, disappointed, white working class vote protest in droves. And this may sound dismissive, and it's not meant to be. I was trying to say, you know, it's a group I quite admire. Um, the, the, the politicians haven't yet found out how to cope with that. And that's why another reason why the Labour Party is more threatened than the Conservative Party, because what was the bedrock of their movement now is, is among some of the more dissatisfied and angry people in society, and they're rather more right-wing than left-wing in their angry reactions. Conservatives win Mansfield, lose Kensington, you know, uh, and uh, but now you're getting me to ramble off on what I think is the much bigger issue of which in Britain, Brexit is the symptom. And so far, the politicians have lost control of it. Quick last one. I mean, how does this story end? Oh, anybody who forecasts where British politics is going to be in a fortnight's time is being reckless. Anybody tells you they're certain they know where we're going you know, is deceiving themselves. Do you think we'll uh, still be in the European Union 10 years from now? Uh, I genuinely don't know. I, I think the reason I have, going back to where we started, the reason why I keep putting down these lowest common denominator attempts to stabilise things, you know, the idea that, I mean, I'm voting to leave the European Union staying in the customs union. That's a million miles uh, from my my ideal vision for the country. Um, but I think, because I think we are definitely doomed to leave. I don't see how we get out of that. Uh, so I want to on the best terms. Now whether, when the dust has settled and we all get over the political hangover from this, a generation will emerge, it is there now, that says, well, what have we done all this for? Why don't we start playing our role as a leading European power again? Why don't we start getting a good free trade relationship with our major partners and customers? Um, it could, in 10 years, be on the way back. I mean, obviously, I would love to believe so. Ken Clark, thank you very much thank indeed for your time today. Thanks for talking to us.